recording. Uh, um, so we've got questions like if we were going to um, have a have a metadata record for a BRE um, and we were going to have a um, persistent identifier, well, what defines a new version of a VRE um, well, if it needed a new persistent identifier? Um, and what are the what metadata um, is needed to make a VRE findable? And if if a researcher is looking for it, is that different metadata than if a developer is looking for it? Okay. So with Accessible, um, if you have a look at that, that document, um, the scope of work, I think there's a pretty good match with data and software fair principles, um, but absolutely happy to take, um, to take uh, suggestions on that. Um, again, enabling interoperability, um, it, it's all about good metadata, um, in a standardized format and, and standardized the, the digital objects that a VRE produces are um, produced in standard um, accessible um, formats and um, the, the vocabularies that the digital objects are described using fair vocabularies. Um, if we were looking at but that seems fairly simple um, if we were looking at, sorry, um, yeah, so it, VREs um, are actually enabling interoperability in the digital objects they produce or create um, is actually where VREs can really shine. Um, and, but the aim of this working group is to produce guidelines for developers on how to implement FAIR in VREs. So, uh, for instance, we'll need to define what a fair vocab actually is and how they can be used in a VRE. Um, and later we'll discuss crowdsourcing examples of how VRE, VREs um, enable data and metadata standardization later in this session. Uh, it's more complicated for VREs being interoperable. So do we need to add anything to the list that we have there on the right? Uh, So we just, uh, I've got storage and compute and software uh, being inter interoperable. Sorry, just, just one random thought. So yeah. <clears throat> some platforms um, might use third party services like Globus. So there's sort of broker intermediary elements that might facilitate interoperability between platforms if they're, even if they're not necessarily working directly together. I don't know whether that's sort of, maybe that's, sort of included under APIs, but just uh, another thought I had while you're talking. Mm. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's back to the granularity question, Kerry. It's, you know, how far, yeah. mm. how far down the stack do you go? I mean, um, one of the examples that we quoted in the, the paper we gave at uh, the International Data Curation Conference last week was, uh, what about a, a VRE that is in turn calling elements of microservices provided by other VREs via um, APIs. And this talks about APIs, but it's, I guess, um, uh, APIs that there's the APIs that the platform itself provides, and then there's the APIs that it depends on, um, as well as all of the underlying layers of the, the operating system and the relational database, and goodness only knows what it sits on. Um, I was just thinking, um, yeah, feel, yeah, absolutely. Feel free to keep um, making comments and, uh, and um, about this as we go through, because it's, um, although there is a link to these slides in um, the document, it's probably easier uh, rather than trying to remember what's on all of them and have a chat later if we chat as we go. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, actually, hang on, just let me, I'm just getting a bit of, um, 
the way it's just been very diffusely papered. Okay. Um, okay, so the next. Okay, um, so if we were looking at, oh, sorry, I don't know what's going on. My a computer keeps skipping multiple slides and I'm not sure why. Right, uh, so reusability is where it gets really interesting. Um, I'm really sorry, I can't actually, I can't see everything and it's, I can't actually see my notes some reason. Right. Um, so, um, so the fair data principles say that the ultimate goal of fair is to optimize the reuse of digital objects. <clears throat> so, um, and it's talking about having really well described um, digital objects so they can be replicated and or combined in different settings. Uh, and we can say that the same thing for BREs, that they're described with plurality and of accurate and relevant attributes. And I think we need to talk about what those attributes are. So, for instance, what information um, for, for potential reusers of a BRE, what, is, um, what do we need to know? So, what is use? Uh, info is usually to developers um, and to users of a BRE that um, might be using it um, uh, in a in a different setting. So, um, should we be defining um, some core metadata requirements to make a BRE or components thereof reusable? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I, I agree that would be useful. It would be a non-trivial task. Um, and again, we'd have to decide at what granular at what granularity level we were we were going to have it apply. So if we think back mm. to Dimitri's comment earlier, yeah, do we do it for every one of the tools that we embed inside a VRE? Do we do it just for the VRE platform itself? Um, I feel like we probably need to do both because tools are potentially going to be deployed across multiple different VREs. So it'd be nice if the description of the reusable elements or however we capture the reusability of a component traveled with it. Mm. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is like a, it's a fractal thing, right? As you, the more you dig in, the yeah. more, more pieces that emerge. And, and, and I think um, pragmatically for, for this, I think it's a matter of working out what the initial starting point is that's most practically useful, um, sort of getting the rule sets for that, and then, then going in on a journey that as we go, we'll find that some areas you want to dive in further and the other areas, it probably doesn't matter as much. So, um, yeah, I think the initial thing is to have a discussion around at what point do we think will be most practical to start these off at, um, knowing that after we get that, we'll probably want to dive in deeper in, in certain areas. But by then we'll have a bit more experience of what works and what is useful and what's not so useful. Hmm. Yeah, Kieran, I'm, I'm imagining or envisaging talking to um, BRE developers and, and asking them, you know, when you're looking for, um, you know, you know, you need one piece of the technical ar architecture and when you're looking for something um, that exists that you can either copy or reuse or, um, you know, just use um, as a service, um, you know, what do you need to know about it? Um, do you think that's a that's a valid sort of way of going about this? Yes, um, the, the only thing 
which is a bit hard to um, how to put that is that uh, it's not necessarily metadata or putting it in a very large definition because usually what's mostly useful is a good readme on how to install how the components work and it's stretching a bit far the definition of metadata that's to say okay it's the just the description i, I don't know I, I would count a readme file as metadata i'd be happy with that i don't think it has to be uh you know yeah i don't think it has to be um structured differently than that what do other people think you could maybe make recommendations about the the kinds of things that such a good readme file should contain could should contain yeah, yeah. Yeah, a README file may help with the uh, reusability, may be difficult for the other aspects. So it may not replace the other, um, you know, metadata needed to make things findable and interoperable. Uh, yeah. Logistics. Yeah. So uh, Jonathan's had his hand up for a little while. So Jonathan, do you want to go? Thanks, Kieran. Um, yeah, just to the you know the, the the problem of describing accurately the the um, the platform and you know the question around granularity and what people are looking for. I mean, um, in many senses, in many ways, people aren't looking for a platform; they're looking for the services in the platform. So, in in many ways, you know, a good platform um, it'll be the services that are more visible than the platform itself. Like when I go on Netflix, I don't have to know that AWS is underneath it. I know that I'm interacting you know all i care about as a user is there's a service so in terms of you know what would be useful metadata how would you describe the platform to make it findable um yeah like as uh, as your point what info is useful to developers that, that's yeah um, I, I disagree on the um, because reusability of the vi should precisely be the deployment uh face the ability to reuse in another context and aws is quite a bad uh example as a whole the protocols are reusable and etc but the service isn't really reusable as such i guess it depends where the audience is so developers would have a different interest or a different take on reuse than a than a user would have and so mm. they're, they're interested in a different description um i was going to say john or andrew do you want to give a quick um mention of the different levels of reuse as per your idcc paper last week sure um i'm going to stop sharing yeah if you can just stop sharing briefly um, so let me just do two slides. And please feel free to contribute to the shared notes document because it's really hard. <laughs> Andrew's been trying to take notes, but he can't while he is talking. Yeah, I, no, I, can't I can't at all. I've got too many screens open as it is. So yeah, like it's fine, Kerry. I'm happy to go back to taking notes once I do this. So this is from a talk that um, I gave last week based on a paper that John Kerry and I wrote for the International Digital Curation Conference, um, brackets, best paper award, <laughs> close brackets. <laughs> um, so the, the concept here is that we want to think about platforms as critical elements in what we're calling the fairness pipeline. And uh, we cited a paper by Ramazani, which came out of one of the Fair's Fair work, work packages, which said that platforms could either enable fairness, that is, they would make things more fair as they go through, respect the fairness of the objects, that is, make them no worse, or reduce the fairness. Um, and so that's, that's the first part of what Kerry was talking about, which is how do we, how do we ensure that the platform's VRE science gateways interact appropriately with the data that they're processing. But the thing that Kerry wanted me to talk about was 
if you're trying to ensure greater reusability for platforms, what we did in this paper was identify four different patterns of reusability. So four different ways you could think about reusing platforms. Um, and I'm not going to give the IDCC talk again, but well, unless we need to, but um, essentially the idea there is that the simplest uh, possible reusability, reusability pattern is you simply access something that's running somewhere else. Slightly more complicated than that is you um, take something that exists and adopt it. You, you run up your own instance of it. Uh, more complicated, again, is where you take something that somebody else has built and you adapt it for a different set of use cases and possibly uh, different connections to data and uh, different tools. Um, and the most difficult is where you look at uh, a set of services and you say, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to abstract out of those a common service that we make available, let's say, as a national level. And the paper provided a number of examples of how we've done that in Australia. Is that what you were looking for, Kerry? Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Andrew. And there are pros and cons of each of those, obviously, and it, de it depends on what you're trying to do. Mm. Maybe I'll just follow um, up my point there to say that, mm. <clears throat> you know, with that, with that model of those four different paradigms, there's different metadata that be relevant for each each paradigm. So how do you, you know, describe a platform fully for all audiences? Can yeah. you get a, a core, you know, the core set of metadata would be fairly, have to be fairly comprehensive, wouldn't it, to hit all those different use cases? Yeah. Uh, I think there's, uh, I'd like to add sort of two more dimensions to this at the expense of making it uh, more complex than, than it is. <laughs> Um, I think one one is that uh, you know uh, we need the metadata for a developer who's trying to take understand what we are using there. How do we incorporate that in something they're trying to do? Uh, the other end of other side of it is also uh, as a user, how do we uh, reuse uh, VREs in my uh, processing pipeline? Um, so I think both of those are there, but. Uh, another dimension, I think, um, I keep looking at these things from an evolution perspective. So if you have, if you go back, you know, um, 10, 15 years when all the VREs and all these were very novel, we would, no one knew what they were, just had the idea and we were exploring this. And, and there were lots of different variations that happened. Uh, everything from little packaged systems that we built to more web-based ones and, and, and so on. And over time, that's, those have become more productive. So we kind of have a formula of how we might build these things. Uh, and, they, and some have become more stable. So there's sort of that evolution pattern. And then we start can build on top of those ones. Um, and I think the metadata you want is also different in each one of those. So it's something that's that they're very much at that um, genesis of, of those ones. Uh, we'll need different kind of metadata that say, Wait, you know, say this is fairly experimental. What it is, what is its governance? How will it? Can I, if I reuse it, will I know that it will last, or will it change tomorrow? Something that's a lot more mature and more evolved, more standardized. You have more trust in that one that that will be more, more likely to be more stable, and that you can build on top of it with more confidence. Um, and one of the patterns you see is that the more standardized and more stable the underlying piece has become, the more innovation it allows building on top of that. So how do we think about this in that sense as well? To, to me, the, the whole, the VREs are at more at that maturing stage now that we're trying to build on top of what we've already done in the past and build more sophisticated tools and more novel ones. So I think thinking of it that way and being able to categorize some of these will be useful that way. So Kieran, do you think instead of producing, trying to produce, um, you know, core metadata requirements for this, it might be more useful to produce a checklist of what to look for, um, you know, the questions to ask when, when reusing or look, looking to reuse 
Ouais, on fait le... Um, it, yes, I think that will be useful too. So one thing to draw on, um, I think a couple of years ago, there was the um, how to make a vocabulary fair or 10 simple rules that was published, mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic, right? On around vocabularies how, uh, in there. Uh, but then, then led to the thinking of, well, how do you govern vocabularies? So we started off with saying, what are the rules to govern vocabularies? Um, but as we were going through that, it emerged that, you know, actually that's really hard, hard to put a set of rules around it because there are uh, different vocabularies are at different stages of evolution. They need mm -hmm. different types of rules to be applied at it. So the rules you want to apply at, at uh, a set of vocabularies that are emerging as a novel, you know, new research discipline are very different to the kind of governance rules you'd want to have for, let's say, the the uh, medical um, uh, uh, um, vocabularies that uh, the international yeah. vocabularies, right? Um, so yeah, what what that evolved into is say trying now working through a set of concerns, governance concerns that you want to think about, you know, and then say you know what are the work out of that, how should it apply to it, you know, just it, so mm. yeah, that that's another approach that would be useful, especially when it's a bit more ambiguous. And then you know, certainly some things, the mature ones, can be codified and set rules. The others might less be less so. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, there's a link if anyone's interested in that. That the ten simple rules for vocabs. There's a link in the slides. Um, Okay. I'll, I'll dig up the link to the current thinking on, on the yeah. go governance concerns. Well, so we where's that through? Yeah, where's that through, Kieran? Uh, well, that, that's um, happening as part of core data and, and uh, DDI work yeah. that, that's ah, happening yeah. and progress mostly through the work happening in Australia at the moment. Okay. We have a lot of people who love vocabs in Australia. Okay, I'll share my screen again um, and we'll just keep going through the questions and concerns. Okay, uh, so next. Okay, so uh, the one of the, oh, hang on. Sorry, this looks like I've skipped a whole lot of slides again. Oh uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> so uh, the next part of the fair principles for both data and software are licensing. So I've got a question. Could a VRE assign a license? Or should it, could it suggest or guide the user in choosing a license for um, outputs? Is that something possible? Sorry, Kerry, can I ask just a scope question? Do you mean a license yeah. for the average researcher who's using the VRE to do stuff or a license for developers who want to reuse elements of it? Oh, or no, both? so this isn't, this is in the enabling digital, the, the reusable digital objects side. So this is the, um, the digital objects produced by a VRE. By the VRE, okay, thank you. Yep. So if, you know, a data set comes out of a VRE, say maybe um, the outputs of a model or something, uh, should a v could or should a VRE be ass assigning a license to those um, as a part of the other metadata that I would hope it would package up? Um, or could it guide the user in choosing a license? Is that something that we want to encourage? I think it's a good idea to encourage it, but it's a bit hard to to say that because it really depends on the VRE features. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially if there's data in, in inside the VRE that yeah. 
that whether have... the VRE keeps data and metadata or if it's just transiting. Yeah, actually, it's a good point. If um, if you're thinking about the data that's um, if a VRE had a, um, if the metadata on the the data that um, a VRE holds. Um, or or can access from other sources. If that had license information, um, it, if the VRE could include the license information for all the component data sets um, in the um, in the final output of metadata, that would help someone choose a license because then you'd know whether or not, um, for instance, if there was share alike licenses, then you can't apply a an open license. Um, oh yeah, that's a really good point. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's kind of case. it's it's sort of walking back the license elements of the provenance mm. metadata. Mm. Yeah, so it could flag any. Um, yeah, I know really that nice in the, the software realm, um, that's that's always an issue knowing what you can license your software when you've used five different other software packages that have different licenses. It's a minefield trying to work out what to. What you can and can't do. Just to throw another dimension in, um, you know, some uh, environments, some some platforms have plans around cost recovery and their sustainability uh, in their in the sustainability path. So there's an implication around licenses there, right? If you're if you're buying a license to, if you need to pay in some way to use a platform, you know, is there a site license? Is individual user license? So does that in what what if what's I guess I'm wondering what sort of impact that dimension would have on this question. Do you mean in terms of the license for the VRE itself? Or, or like is that yeah, well, does it, so yeah. if if a, if it there becomes a, a cost recovery, you know, a chargeback mm. method uh mechanism in place around the mm. platform, does that have implications for the license thing? I assume it would. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. And then so that's on the, the other side, on the right hand side here, on the mm. being reusable side. Mm. Um, you know, I've suggested that you could say software that makes up a VRE is given a clear and accessible license, but do VREs as a whole have licenses? Can they have licenses? Because, and, and, and it goes to um, um, what you were just saying then is, is it, you know, yeah, if there is charges, is it, do you get a, um, is there a usage agreement or is it just terms and conditions of use? Um, <clears throat> I think the word license probably doesn't mean the same thing for data or software or yes, then we, a service. We're coming Sorry. a bit in the overlapping uh, spot between a thing like strictly fair and maybe something more like the trust principle also with the terms of use um i'm not entirely familiar with the trust principles do you want to there are uh, principles for repositories um oh the trusted yeah the or trusted uh, government uh, governance aspects and use rather focused on the service than just mm. uh, the um, the platform as a digital object, like for example, would be with RS. Yeah, because because the VRE really becomes, it, in most cases, it, it is a service, not in all cases. Um, but in most cases, it would be a service. Yeah, for example, certification, which has been mentioned by Christine, would be something on the trans, the T, which is transparency, and maybe also on the sustainability. Mm. So we could say that the software that makes up a VRE, oops, sorry. Software that makes up a VRE, um, it would be 
good for those licenses to be clear and accessible. But the VRE as a whole, it doesn't necessarily make sense. We need a different uh, we need a different way yeah, of looking at that. Yeah, it's it's not really licensed, but it's a very interesting point to as a service to be to be reusable. Mm. Oh, thanks for posting that. Ah, oh, the trust principle for digital repositories. What what would a license for a VRE be? Oh, sorry, I'm sharing. <laughs> Ah, uh, um, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What What is it ten, intended to do? Is it? Yeah. Is it about your the license to use the VRE, the license to reuse the VRE, to remix it? Yeah. Or, I, you know, uh, I was, I was thinking, reuse, but. However, I, I wonder if we can just simplify it and all the reusability of the VRE to reperform the analysis or etc. It's just the enabling the fair digital object because you can redo, reaccess the VRE. There's no. I don't know if it's very clear, but maybe we're just asking the trying to, to put it in the wrong box. So, so Dimitri, are you saying that the license, the reusability of the VRE would need to be, oh, sorry, no, I shouldn't say that. Let me start that again. Are you saying that we should constrain the problem down, at least initially, to can I use the VRE to reproduce a particular piece of research? Yes, because that's what the um, terms of use are about, more about what you process than the service, which is its license would be just a license of the software as mentioned. Yeah, okay. And all the terms of service things that still are very interesting will be only related to the left part. Hmm. Yep, that seems like a, a useful way of simplifying the problem and taking a first step. Okay, I'll move to the next one, but happy to come back at any time if I, if I can move, there we go. Uh, so, um, the next part of reusability, well, the last part actually of no. Sorry, it's not the last part. I knew there was something missing. This is the problems of working from home on a very small screen. I can't see everything when I'm sharing. Okay. Um, so we're we were talking about a lot of what we've talked about is provenance um, and, and getting a VRE to um, put out really detailed provenance information. So um, I would like to propose that that's a v VRE should aim to produce to ex um, export provenance metadata with a digital object. Um, I've got a question in terms of the VRE itself being reusable. Um, the software principles state that software is associated with detailed provenance. So I've suggested that software within a VRE is associated with detailed provenance. Um, does that make sense? And what about VREs as a whole? Do, do would the provenance of how it was how it came about be useful, or does that not make sense? It it, it does. Um, but I'd like to also add on the enabling side, Kerry, because I I think mm -hmm. yeah, I completely agree that and, and that that VREs should enable provenance. But I think we need to go further than that because we, it's one thing for each VRE to produce provenance. But when you have doing some research, you're doing building a tool chain, you pro won't be using just one VRE often. You might be using a, a mm. set of these ones. The provenance needs to go, goes of your research goes across all of those ones. 
Yeah. So you need to also have interoperability of the provenance yeah. output. So the provenance from one can be read and added to by the next VRE in your tool chain. So I think that has to be a key, key piece that we do, mm. in here, that VRE should enable. And I think that that's, you know, um, and the same goes, I think, you know, the provenance of the VRE is also important. In the, mm. and all should all be bundled into one. Uh, you know, we might have some ontology and structures in there, but it is a, a really crucial that we preserve that um, that provenance. Um, so we are we are now at the point that we're building incredibly complex workflows that you know go the rabbit hole goes very deep, um, and the trusting of of that output is the ability to do that. But that provenance also needs to be not just human readable, it also needs to be machine readable. Mm. Um, so that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, so that the provenance should be fair in of itself. Um, do you or anyone else on the call know of where we're up to for fair provenance metadata? It's not something I've looked at for a Quite a while. Not something I'm I'm aware of. Although, can I, Kerry, suggest that possibly you might want to mute Kieran because every time he speaks, he gives us something that is a whole other working group. <laughs> <laughs> I, I meant that nicely, Kieran. I'm sorry, Andrew. <laughs> um, I mean, um, but yes, there there is um uh, the. In, in the semantic world, there is the standard of provenance of prof, which yep. does cover that, uh, which is a starting point. Um, How is the implementation of prof going? Is it becoming more widely used? Uh, I don't know about your communities. In our communities, it's very, very restricted, and I guess uh, people are still in the beginning of implementing prov and that's why maybe they are not so much of the standards or etc popping out because people are already getting it this first step well, which mm. can be quite extensive if you go down the ontology uh, alignment route mm. Dimitri I, I see you're from Inre. Um can yes. you just maybe give us a like a, a two minute overview of what INRE does okay. and uh, what communities you were just talking about there? Sure. Uh, we're the French uh, National Institute for Agronomy and Environment. And therefore we have uh, communities in these domains, including uh, well, environmental data, mostly agricultural data, but that includes uh, actually quite a broad range because there was also the um, social science aspects to related to agriculture and all the genomics part uh, to crop uh, genotyping and phenotyping. Thanks, that's very helpful. And as for the um, which communities inside of this whole uh, group of communities are, already on ontology aspects, mostly the genotyping and phenotyping communities that are on the edge rather than, uh, rather than the others. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. Um, okay, so we're in agreement that provenance is important. Um, so we will move on to the next. Okay, so I think this is the last one. Um, this is a, um, the, the last part of reusable, the reusable, uh, the principles for reusable is that digital objects produced by VRE meet domain relevant community standards. So the question I have 
um, for a VRE being reusable, are there domain relevant standards for VREs? Does that even make sense? And what domain are we talking about here? That may, may sense in a very technical way with the, for example, the API standards you use. They might be interoperable, yeah. but they have to be also used. Yeah, so we're, so we're talking more about a, a technology domain here. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't know if there are also the aspects that the only one I can think of now. Hmm. John, can you think of, uh, I mean, it, we don't have to, um, obviously, as a, we're not producing principles for VREs, we're doing implementation guidelines. Is there another way we can frame this rather than saying things like domain standards or standards at all? Is there, um, you know, technology best practice, software development best practices that we could put in here? Yeah. It, it, Sorry, please go on. Sorry, yeah, um, I agree, Kerry. So again, it's a matter of who the target audience is. If we're talking about being reusable by developers, then yeah, you know, um, uh, you know, common technologies or well accepted technologies, best practices, you know, technologies that, that developers are likely to be able to. Um, to reuse easily. Um, whether you'd want to mandate that is another thing. Or whether you'd want to sort of say that, you know, it has to use Docker or something is, hmm. you know, probably going too deep. But, you know, if it's equally, if it's all written in some ancient assembly language, it's probably not good either. So I'm not sure how you'd exactly describe that, but something along the lines of, you know, that it's implemented in, in well accepted technologies and to, to common to common standards, that sort of thing. So I can think of a counter, well, I don't know if it's a counter example, John. Um, and I and I I don't think we're talking about standards that you would mandate. But for instance, if you were doing something in the astronomy space, you would need to make a fairly well, again, I'm back into mandate like mandate language. It would be reasonable to assume that you'd use the IVOA standards, the International Virtual Observatory Alliance standards, for doing something in astronomy, just because that's what everyone else in that domain uses. And maybe in the geospatial world, you might make a similar argument about OGC. Mm. Um, but those are the only two examples that I can think of where there's a, a strong link between the way the domain builds software. Um, and the availability of uh, particular standards that you could point to. So, so I think yes and no. I mean, that those standards are the face that a piece of software presents. But if that's you know, do we want to, in terms of enabling reuse, do we want to encourage people to provide you know to use technologies underneath or behind that face that are easily adoptable and adaptable? Oh, okay. You know, because your your yeah. uh, WCS can be uh, or whatever. You know, your service can be in, in Java. It could be in in, in Cherry Pie. It could be, and that and that will affect things. So if you if your service, so if you've got a service that implements one of the IVOA data service standards, if that's distributed as a container with with a um, you know, with a, with a uh, YAML file or something for the API, that's going to be easily repurposable. But if it's in some arcane, undocumented code, it's not. Yeah, that's true. Yes. And and in so so the distinction you're making there, which is I think a really good one, is between the software itself and the services that it exposes. Yeah. Again. Yeah. So again, it's this target audience with, with who's the target audience for reusability. If, if we're talking about having the software be reused and leveraged and, and extended and all those sort of good things. Uh, there's some practices in the back end that would facilitate that. 
Okay, I almost his... think. Sorry, please go on. Sorry, as we said, Kieran's got his hand up, and we also have a comment in the chat. So, Kieran. Oh, sorry. You are mute. Didn't realize you put me on mute. <laughs> um, no, no. Um, look, I, I agree with what Jonathan is saying, uh, and with with some caveats in there. Uh, and I was wondering if I could share something for a second. Sure. Let me stop sharing. Go for it. Um, once I work out, oh, here we go. Share. Can you see that? And is that readable? Uh, I can, we can see yes. it. Can you put can it you, into present yes, mode? Yes, thank you. Yeah, if you can go into present mode. Yeah, let me see. There yeah, we go. Yeah, now I can't see anybody else, so, you know, that's why I'm like, uh, I just wanted to focus the attention on the bottom half of this, on the technology piece. Uh, there's a slide I'd use for something else. Uh, but in line with what I was telling earlier, where technology is a move, you know, have that novel to, to utility services. I, I do think, agree with, with what John's saying in that, that things that are in that, you know, on the right hand side, um, the mature the, the technology stacks are mature and we can start to to put some strong guidelines around what people should adopt on the other hand the stuff that gets built on the left hand side if we put too many constraints there we start stifle innovation and we don't want to do that either so i think part of it is recognizing where things are and saying these guidelines apply if you're building something that's fairly mature uh, in there. Whereas if you're breaking new ground, then we might have a set of, separate set of um, guidelines or, or you know, things to consider. So, uh, I think it's yeah. still compatible because for example, the example of John of YAML is not to say you have to use YAML, but you have to, to use something that is open, um, readable and easy to transform in other thing if YAML goes deprecated and we use another standard. Yes. And also just um, before I forget, sorry, uh, another point a bit different. I agree with um, what you propose on the, um, for example, the protocols for astronomy and etc. But isn't it actually more related to the reusability of the data uh, for the service than the VRE itself. Sorry, can you say that again, Dimitri? I missed that. Yeah, sorry. I Just that last sentence? Um, yeah, that um, the point on the um, scientific protocols being used mm -hmm rather than the technology itself on which it is built. It's actually more related to the reusability of the data than the service. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And I think that also relates to the comment that uh, Qian Zhang, I apologize for mangling your name, um, has made in chat. So I would maybe counter Dimitri's point, uh, well, well sort of not counter it, but sort of um, complementary to that is the, the standards obviously help the reusability of the data, but they also help reusability of the standard. Uh, so they, and they help the developers who are implementing to standards. So as Kieran was talking, I was thinking um, one of the, uh, when you're at the innovation end of the spectrum, sometimes uh, that's when reference implementations might pop out of the mix. And they can be a really useful foundation as you go forward to that, that place where things are much more production, uh, or sort of more stable and more, um, more entrenched or, or whatever, because that's, that gives uh, develop, developers a leg up. You know, the first thing I used to look for when I was working in the IBRA standard space was always a reference implementation that I can I can grab to see how these things actually, you know, play out in someone else's context and what how what can I learn from that? How can I modify that? Hmm. 
Well, Kieran, isn't that what the VREIG has been looking at for a while, um, looking at a reference architecture? Yeah, we, we've been toying with that, but we haven't really made progress on, mm -hmm. on that. Um, yeah, the groups talked about it, but it really needs a, a working group or something like that established to, to drive it forwards. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I just wanted to ask, so thank you all for um, discussing those questions that I'd put forward. Um, that was really useful. Um, and there's lots of great considerations that we'll, um, we'll have to look at. Um, so one um, thing that we've got in the agenda is um, we called it a panel discussion, but as I said, there is so there's so few of us here um, that it would just um, talking about the challenges of implementing VREs that enable fair digital objects. Does anyone have any um, any examples of challenges that they um, that they face? I face doing this. Noting that we have seventeen minutes left. Yes. I mean, I, I can kick it off. One of the one of our current platforms was talking recently. So in um, I run a program where we've invested in twenty six platforms projects, and one of ours uh, that is a field data collection app um, said that one of their major challenges is actually getting the in the archaeology field um, field data collection in archaeology getting the archaeologists to allow them to standardize the metadata um, or so that what they actually want what the researchers want is a digital copy of their paper form with their foot the fields that they would usually use exactly the same but on a on an ipad whereas what the team are trying to do is encourage them to standardize that metadata and standardize the data collection to make it really easy for them to make the data fair down the track and trying to get the team the field teams to agree to that is really hard because it's different to what they're used to so that's i mean that's not really a technical challenge that's definitely a social challenge um it's it's getting the researchers to do things in different ways um yeah, culture change is an issue of itself. Um, Kira? Uh, but thanks, Kerry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I know the challenge there and, and, and just wanted to um, tell a little story from, from the work we've been doing, I've been recently involved in. Uh, the biodiversity space and, and the ecology space have the same kind of challenges, right? There is. Uh, the data then there that people capture in their field notebooks is extremely rich. And the biodiversity standard, uh, the main one is being picked up in core, um, is uh, very lossy when you translate it into that. Uh, and that's been a challenge. Uh, and and uh, so, but we've in uh, some of the work that um, Turn have done here, they, they've started, because they've had that challenge, uh, they've, they've looked at the semantic and link data, uh, and and that's much better at being able to do that. And we're finding we we in the process of establishing a standard for on that and start using that. And while the initial conversation is, hang on, that doesn't work. That will, we can't standardize these ones. So because the, the the technology in that in that of semantic is is very granular and very rich, and it preserves the context. Whereas uh, in the in the tabular world, that that tends to not be the case. So what we're finding is that people are a lot less resistant and really understanding actually this represents the knowledge captured in my notebook, and in a in a digital form without it being lost. So I can recreate the depth of knowledge that's in my notebook. Um, and we're finding that we're getting a lot of traction on that. Mm. It's early days, but just that there's just that different model. Whereas in the previous one, we try to put it into a in the in a tabular standards that we normally use. Uh, we find they're, they're lossy, and there are a lot of impl 
supplied information between things that that if you don't have all the context it's lost so the reuse mm. value is also reduced um so that we're finding that that's getting a lot of traction with the practitioners um and um the ability to infer information from that is is quite high uh but creating another challenge of of data literacy in there mm. it's a whole new way of thinking that people have to think about and understand but yeah it's, in, it's interesting that um you know with the the advancements in um in semantic um the semantic space that you're actually able to provide something that the researchers needed which you couldn't do before yeah um does anyone else want to throw up a challenge Or is this going to be really easy? Well, perhaps we can move on then to the um, the last part, um, reviewing the timeline of future work packages. Uh, so the work plan, there's a link to the work plan in the uh, in the shared notes, but I'll just put it in the chat now. This has been interrupted by COVID, etc., cetera, um, and movements of chairs, et cetera. Um, so we definitely are looking at, um, definitely are looking at um, involving the members of the group more and actually setting up clear um, outputs and what we can um, um, and, and so that people can contribute. So it's absolutely um, the RDA working groups um, basically are run, um, they have co chair, they have chairs, but um, they're run on the efforts of the members. And so we are absolutely looking for people who are interested in this space um, to contribute and um, and work on some of our outputs. So we need to um, we need to finalize the the gap analysis and um, that um, that in the next month or so and produce. Um, a document about how VREs could and should be can and should be fair and enable fairness for other digital objects, and then we need to collect um, case studies um, of how to achieve a fair and fair enabling VRE. So um, we're looking at case studies from all over the world of VREs, virtual labs, platforms, science gateways, um, and how how they are um, how they are being made fair and fair enabling. Uh, so that um, and then if we need to, it depends on how I think we will, um, we will need to produce some guidance for developers. Um, and we've got that set for November, but I think it might take a bit longer than that. Um, and then the next part would be um, planning for the adoption of that guidance. That's something that um, we'll definitely be doing in Australia via the ARDC Platforms Program um, and in the US through the Science Gateways Community Institute. But we are absolutely looking for other partners um, in other parts of the world who would be looking at contributing case studies and then um, helping implement any developer guidance. Kerry, can I ask a what I think is a timing question? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the idyllic golden days pre-COVID, uh, when we had plenaries every six months, mm. um, you would run a working group for 12 to 18 months, and then mm. you'd present at the plenary. Um, Hillary hasn't announced this yet, uh, and presumably will do so at the end of this week, but it seems likely that there'll be some kind of face-to-face -face event early next year. Yeah, uh, that's a little bit under eighteen months since yep. we first got um, approval. 
Yeah. And then the next thing is going to be September, which is close to two years since we got approval. Mm. Given the COVID interruptions, I suggest we target September next year, the, the next International Data Week. I think yeah. going for an early 2023 event is going to be a little bit courageous. Yeah, because we first assumed it would be in May. And yeah. That was what we were planning for. Um, but yeah, September is probably, if we're looking at, um, you know, examples of adoption, then yeah, I think September would be a lot more doable uh, if that if that is okay with RDA uh, I think RDA will need to be flexible I mean I don't mm. speak for RDA anymore um, but I think people understand that the world's been a bit of a mess uh, over the last couple of years and that running mm. late is not the end of the world I mean we could try and wrap our work up before September but present it at September yeah yeah I think that would be that would be good. Um, where is the early 22 plenary? Is that going to be in uh, in Austria, isn't it? No, 2023. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think oh, yeah. I think Dimitri means early 2023. Um, the yeah, the the September one in 2023 is going to be Salzburg. Uh, yeah. Dimitri. Yes, Dimitri may be referring to the. The rumours that I've also heard, which is somewhere in the Nordic region. I don't want to go any further than that. But it, look, it's um, Dimitri, it's no worse than any other place to get to from Australia, quite honestly. Um when, hey, when, when's the where's the sorry, when is the Salzburg plenary? September is my memory, September 23. It's oh, the next okay, international so the day. Early. Look, Dimitri, I just have to ask my boss, and he's sitting here in this uh in this meeting, whether or not I'm allowed to go to uh, to uh, Austria in 2023, uh, I will certainly be making the argument on your behalf, Kerry. Thank you. And you've got and you're recording the session. Yeah, that's right. Um, it would be wonderful to be there in person. Yeah, agreed. Not least so that we don't have to do this at 2 a.m. because that does make things slightly difficult. Well. Yeah, hence, so, yeah. Hence the small numbers today. So, was, um, uh, so Dimitri, given you work for Inre, this you joined this meeting at four in the morning. Oh uh, no, I'm actually joining from Seoul. So, oh, oh well, bad. okay, okay. Well, that's okay. Good. I'm, I'm pleased. I mean, you've you've paid the jet lag tax already. Yeah. Okay. Um, so next steps, um, we'll have meetings um, between, obviously, before the next plenary. Uh, and so if you join up to the work, if you're not already a member of the working group, sorry, yeah, the working group, Fairfax Area's working group, then um, please sign up as a member. That way you will get all of the, um, you'll get emails and we will start having um, working meetings, I think, with um in terms of progressing um this gap analysis and our guidance does someone has the rda website page on hand yeah i will yeah it's not something we've put in this latest document i've got the folder but not the uh Here we go. There you go. Ah. Thanks. Oh, it's two different URLs. I assume they both work. Oh, oh no, that's I didn't do them. Why are they two different? Uh, no, ignore mine. It doesn't mine doesn't work. Okay. So Sorry. the first one, not the second yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. You want Kieran put in? Uh, I'll work. put that in the document as well in the notes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm already doing it. Uh, Don't you worry. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Dimitri. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. 
if there's um Oh, I would say the with the scope of work, that scope of work document, so that is linked to from the, the notes, please feel free to go in there, have a good look and put any comments you like in there. It's a living document. Um, all of the questions I presented in the slides are in that document in yellow. So um, I will update that with the out, um, with the notes that we've taken that Andrew thank you very much has taken today of um, from all your comments um, and suggestions and input um, I'll update that as best as I can but please do feel free to go in there and add more questions um, add suggestions comments whatever you like if you're going to change the actual text please use track changes so that we uh, all suggest know. yeah suggestions sorry because it's in google docs Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy and the rest thank, of Thanks to Kerry for chairing the meeting as she recovers from COVID. At, and slightly uh, last minute. <laughs> and slightly last minute, yes. Um, to all of you who are in person um, in International Data Week, have a great week. Yeah, enjoy. enjoy the rest of the session. Have fun for us. <laughs> thank thanks. you. Thank you, John. Thanks. Thanks, Kieran. Cheers, folks. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye.